Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, actually, it's the other way around, and there are much more us covering this work, but um, very kind. Uh, it was really always the other way around, but anyhow, I appreciate it. Um, I also appreciate it that I'm here. It's a fantastic environment. Um, we were just discussing how we can transport some of this stuff to Germany. Maybe I can invite you in two years, and then we have a similar environment there. <coughs> Uh, that's at least cross fingers for me. So for this talk, um, yeah, I would like to talk about deep machines that know when they don't know. If you have questions, uh, my goal is that we do not finish this time. That's fine, right? Always interrupt, ask questions, completely fine with me. Okay, in terms of what is all this about, if I get my machine done, <coughs> this way. Um, at least if you're in North America, that's where we are. Um, DARPA and many other people are trying to push what is called the third wave of AI. And the, the, the idea in a sense is, um, in the early days of AI, we understood somehow how good it is to program something, but this is very difficult as well. So classical example by now is if you want to define what is a dog, what is a cat, that's pretty hard, right? You can come up with a rough definition quickly, but then there are all these little um, differences between cats and dogs that uh, it's hard for humans to really get them and then also to formalize them. And therefore, there's this next level where you start out to make use of machine learning. Machine learning was all around for a long time already, but now currently there's a lot on differential programming and deep neural networks, and that is helping a lot because now instead of us providing a definition for something, we can hope with enough data, whatever enough means, have not always to be just big data, but it can also be sometimes only small data, uh, then maybe the data can tell us how to define something, right? It's also like if you teach your children what is a cat and what is a dog, you're not going there and tell always, okay, a cat has four legs and it's um, two, two ears and whatever, you're showing the examples, right? And now with machine learning, you can try to do that in a very same way, also in more advanced Second, however, if you think about it, data is not everything. I mean, I'm here in our situation now, I'm not just dumping data, and I'm not just dumping millions of examples of this is a deep network that knows when it doesn't know, and this is a deep network that doesn't know when it not, doesn't know, and it's trying. And now I'm not dumping tons of examples, but we try to communicate, we try to argue, we try to come up in a dialogue. So overall, the third wave is to make some aspects of AI at least more human-like. So AI per se has not to be human-like, right? I mean, we are just trying to understand, come up with computer programs that mimic or show intelligent behavior. Um, however, if you wonder about a good example for intelligent behavior, then typically we look at humans, but we don't have to mimic humans. If you think of autonomously driving cars, then maybe it's even good to not go for the human, right? Because then otherwise we have as many accidents as before. And so what is the point of that? I can still at least spend my time in the commute on already working, but we also would like to have less many accidents. So the third wave, according to Docker and many other people, is then about AI systems that communicate in a human-like fashion. It has not to be even exactly like that, but at least human-like. And in particular, there's also more reasoning capabilities in there. So it's not just learning, and then we learn to say a reactive agent, meaning that if I see a dog, I instantly say dog. But we may also think a little bit about it and say, oh, if this is a dog, but the dog is on a poster, then maybe I'm not saying it's a dog like a physical, really living, or a live dog, things like that. Uh, you want to contextualize your stuff. So if you have a car entering a village, and then all of a sudden there's a speed limit sign of 120 miles, I don't know whether that even exists, but assume <laughs> that, um, then the machine or the car would not simply say, oh great, I can speed, um, speed up, but it would maybe argue, oh, somehow I'm in a village, and it's very surprising to me that I can speed up in the village. So therefore, maybe I ignore the sign that it's maybe just an adversarial attack by some bad guys, right? So you would like to contextualize and do reasoning, and in particular, also deal with situations that you have never seen before. Because that's what we can do pretty, well, I'm not saying pretty well, but at least 
we know very well the situation that we can say, oh, let me abstain here, yeah, I'm a little bit nervous, like me now in the talk. <laughs> I still try, try, but anyhow, I can express that I'm a little bit nervous. So in all this excitement about deep and, and learning and then why do we need help in a new way is coming from deep neural networks. And deep neural networks are maybe more powerful, or maybe you can prove that they are in a sense more powerful than shallow uh, architecture. So shallow means that <clears throat> you're just looking at your features and you've tried to directly use in a sense your answer to whatever your question is. In a deeper model, you try to, from your features that you're using to describe whatever you want to talk about, you're trying to derive other features. And then from these features you try to derive yet other features. These features have never been observed, we call them latent, and so you're going deeper and deeper. And if you want to be really cool in a sense, don't call it even deep neural, because it's all about differentiable programming. So differentiable here means, if you look at the very standard um, machine learning setup, then you want to use gradients in order to optimize your little knots, we call them parameters. And the parameters tell you how good your parameter is, what, what is it doing, and also consequently how good your model is doing. So here you would like to use gradients. Gradients means you want to differentiate your model, and therefore differential programming means you can now write down more complicated models. You don't even have to care about the gradients and the system, some underlying system is automatically differentiating to some extent, and you can just focus on the model. It was funny because I guess something like 20, 15, 20 years back, if you can't derive your gradient, people rejected your paper saying you're not good enough. You should do that. You should be able to do that. And I still know that people working on all automatic differentiation had a hard time to get their results published. Now it's exactly the opposite again. If you derive your gradient, people get bored. And they say, <laughs> like, hey, why? That can be done automatically. So it's always this battle in a sense. So we, in my group, we are also making use of differentiable programming or deep learning. So for example, we try to use them to understand complicated biological processes, something like the intuition, but I sometimes a little nervous to use this human-like language, because whether a machine has an intuition or not, let's see, I mean, that's a different question in a sense. But we are using that, for example, to understand better uh, plant physiology and doing um, something like high throughput uh, plant phenotyping. So we would like to know how does a plant react on certain stress forms. So it could be not enough water, it could be some biotic stress, some disease. And what is typically happening is that um, there are plant um, biologists or physiologists and they grow plants in all different conditions. But they meaning students go there every day and controlling the experiment and taking data so they climate chambers where they can even control is it more winter, is it summer, is it raining, is it sun, whatever, and then you have, for example, hyperspectral cameras that are taking images where, because you look at now at different wavelength and energies, you can look a little bit into the plant in a non-invasive way, right? So because we would like to know how they react, it wouldn't be good to kill them all the time using DNA tests, and for that you have to kill them in a sense. Um, but that means that you take a lot of effort. And so in one of our early experiments, they send out their students 180 times a year uh, into the fields doing measurements. And so then you say, oh yeah, yeah, great, great, great. Take, give me the data and I can even subsample because it's highly, there's a lot of redundant information in this data. And then the plant physiologist, uh, phys physiologist he, he got nervous. He says, no, 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 no. So first of all, you may throw away the golden nugget that gives me my Nobel Prize. They are very <laughs> unlikely, but not, not because of you, but very <laughs> unlikely. Okay? Um, second, um, still mathematically you can prove that it doesn't work for, the, for this kind of data, but they were nervous. Because the second argument is, no, it's not a good message to my students that you, I tell them, go out into the field 180 days a year, uh, and now you tell me it would have been enough to maybe do it 10 times. So it's not a good story. So then we said, okay, we are not subsampling. Um, we can still do something like PCA, so um, principal component analysis on this data to also reduce dimensionality, make it a bit more handy and as well, 
that we can more easily get a, a grade with it. Um, and then he said, no, 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 but I don't understand PCA, that's a mathematical object. After the transformation, can you still give me biological meaning? Or he was very precise, he said, Christian, what is the biological meaning of an eigenvector? Yeah, good question. I have no clue. Right? So, so we developed our own stuff there. I'm not going into that, but ultimately we got interested in do we actually have to run all these experiments? Or can machine help us running these experiments to some extent? So uh, we are using um, some at adversarial networks now on the hyperspectral uh, scale. Um, to generate, in a sense, you, we, we give them an image of a healthy plant, and then we say, okay, it gets this disease, and tell me how does it look like in five days? How does it look like in 10 days? And they can do that. It's pretty pretty interesting. And so our, our goal is that we can at least produce additional data for data augmentation so that you can do even more, more fancy stuff there. We are also applying them in some engineering uh, context where, for example, you would like to solve initial value problems. So essentially, it's about integration. And then there are classical methods for that, and like Runge Kutter, but now you can use uh, LSTM or whatever favorite, more temporal uh, neural network you want to use in order to control the step size. And you can show a little bit more mathematical that you should use a particular loss function, whatever. So, but you can do it and then show that you get actually better than what we are teaching in classes to engineering students, right? So you can much faster generate good, good results. And then, as everyone, somehow you need a chess champion or champion something. So, uh, our students also did that in a, in a class. So, over summer, they, uh, based on previous interest in chess that they had, they built a system to beat the world championship in what is called Crazy House. Crazy House is a variant of chess where if you read a piece, you can reintroduce it later whenever you like uh, as your color, as your piece. And continue playing. So unfortunately, you can't directly make use of AlphaGo and AlphaZero structure as always. I mean, for for any AI person here, that's not surprising. Then you have to massage everything. For people outside, they always feel like, oh, you only take AlphaGo, AlphaZero, and it works. Uh, unfortunately, not not yet. I, mean, I guess at some point it may work, but you can do it, um, and it works pretty well. And it's exciting because ten years, twenty years back, I guess that would be a lot of work maybe never work. So it's exciting that students with the right passion and the right computer infrastructure can do it. Question. Yeah, um, I'm just curious about the complexity of crazy house. How does it compare with say just like vanilla chats in terms of uh, like difficulty for AI, so to speak? Do you, know? you mean whether I can give you a formal statement that it's in a different context? No, no like in, in the terms of like, I mean, uh, also we would say like chess is a much easier game than Go in terms of like the branching state space and stuff like that. Uh, you are in between here because by, by the option to introducing pieces, you get a higher branching yeah. curve than standard And actually, the is it much higher or? Well, I wanted to say with standard architecture, we didn't manage to get it. So what we had to use is we had to use squeeze nets and we have to use uh, some other like also residual links and so on, but I can't give you a formal statement. Um, <clears throat> if you want to ask me, is it surprising that if you can do standard chess, then you can do also a crazy house? I would say no, it's not surprising, but still you have to work hard to get it run, but it's a strong indicator that you can do it. Yes, um, agreed. So the, the submission is under, under, um, under review right now. We actually don't want to sell it as, oh cool, you can now do crazy house, but we wanted to show also that if you look at the standard AlphaGo and Alpha um, Zero publication, it's very hard to uh, instantiate it if you don't have the code. And so our business was to also show all the little details you have to do. So it's a little bit more like a, even a tutorial. But yeah, you, it's, it's not a one-on-one -on -one transfer. It's a little bit more, but I know it's not like, wow. I mean, otherwise we, have, we would have tried nature. We yeah. haven't. Let me put it this way. Um, although there is some interesting mm -hmm. stuff. So yeah, we can take that offline. I think even in chess, it's interesting. And in particular, so I'm not 100% convinced if you look at the computational effort even for chess, I think humans are still more efficient. So I don't like this argument always that they are superhuman because that's unfair. It's, it's, 
a human with a very weak computer and less data can still do more than alpha zero in my opinion. But that's a different story. It's amazing what Tura and all these people did. So uh, I'm just jealous. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, if you work with that, what you learn is, and, and that's also what we uh, just discussed, there are a lot of design options and design and decisions you have to make to get things running. So this selling argument, at least in the news, just take a deep network, throw it at your data, and you get a result is oversimplifying, right? It doesn't work like that. And I'm a little bit nervous about the biases we are introducing there. And to attack it, to some extent, we were looking at activation functions. So activation functions for those that haven't used in neural networks is this idea that you model it in a very abstract, very simplified way a neuron, a single neuron, and it depends on, um, it, no, it is composed of the input and you typically take most often a linear function to just combine the different inputs and then you put it through the activation function. So you squash it through some non-linearity. Um, but then which one do you use? You use a rectified unit, you use a sigmoid, whatever. And there's a lot of work as a student, it's frustrating to try out different ones. I mean, we settle on a certain form of activation function, but it's not really fun. It doesn't feel also very scientific because it's just trying out. So what we are doing is instead we say, okay, um, let's, let's use a rational function. And let's try to even compute the gradient of the rational function so that you can do in an end-to-end -end fashion do even learning the activation functions. And you can do it, you have to be a little bit careful because with a rational function, you may get pools. If you don't want that, you have to use a slightly different uh, method, but you can do it. And with rational functions, at least um, per se, you can also pretty well um, reach them all the standard um, activation functions. So we were running, for example, experiments on mobile nets now using and initializing the rational functions with what you have used in mobile net, but then it can start to learn its own stuff. And by just learning the activation functions, you get a plus 2% in accuracy or percent points in accuracy. So there seems to be a bias in there and it's unclear how, how to tackle that. Um, so yeah, maybe not all, everything is easy there. So generally there's all this, uh, do we have the right tools to debug these very difficult machine learning or complex machine learning models? And this is triggered by, I mean, you have seen all of that, I guess. You can add a little bit of noise, get a kind of adversarial example, and then all of a sudden, instead of seeing a panda, you see a gibbon. You can print by now glasses, at least if you know the deep network um, that has been used, and by wearing the glasses, you all of a sudden do not appear as uh, a male person, but then become some actress, right? and, and so on. They're, they're, we were more interested in this other science paper where you can show that if you ask humans to show something like, let's say, science, the word science, and then on the left hand you show male, on the right hand you show female, and you ask humans, associate, what do you think is closer to science, male or female, you can measure the reaction times, and it's a classical result, unfortunately, that science is more closely associated to uh, male than females and in humans. And what these guys have shown um, that you can now use machine learning word embedding methods. And then in these word embedding methods, uh, it's, it's a little bit like um, if two words are used quite often together, they are closer to each other in some um, distance meaning. Um, and if they are not used a lot together, then they are typically further away, roughly speaking. And what they were showing is that many of our stereotypes transfer directly into the distance of these embedding methods as well. So you see that the word male is closer to the word science in the embedding space than the word female to science. And that's very bad and it got a lot of attention. And, and in particular, one of the reactions is that we want to have neutral machines. We don't want to have that our biases uh, survive within machines and maybe even boost them at some point. Fully with them, but I got also nervous when I got all this hype about, in particular, the news about that, because there might be also positive stereotypes. 
I mean, maybe we use stereotypes to deal with the complexity of our daily business. And one of these stereotypes might be, from a certain angle, from a certain perspective, that killing people is not good. Because if you think about it, there might be situations where killing people might be good. But our moral decision, our moral ethical framework tells us, no, we don't want that. Right? So we were wondering now whether similar techniques can do that as well. Um, and we are not the only ones. There's the general interest of um, understanding, can we build something like beneficial AI? Can we build ethical AI? It goes deeper, right? It's even by setting it up, can we already, by design, program ethical principles? There's a much interesting work on that we, without, I mean, it's unconsciously, we are transporting a lot of our cultural aspects when programming machines, right? So in a sense, an Asian person may program slightly different from a US American person, from a German person. So who knows? So we, we may have to think about it. Some people claim even that we program in a very maleish way, because most programmers are males. So I don't know. I don't know whether that this is a problem. But there are, of course, questions we should address. But we were in particular interested whether they are also capturing at least to some extent our moral decisions. So um, what we were setting up is a very simple um, technique. You can use Bird for that, but in the, uh, in the beginning we were using just the universal sentence embedder. And so you take all the sentences you have, you, you embed them, and then you can ask questions like, should I kill people? Should I kill time and whatever? And then you just measure how close you are to yes and how close you are to no in a sense and then you provide the answer. And, and I want to show you that this works. Okay, it doesn't work. How do we get that with the sound? Uh, uh, I, it's, it's in German. Should I avoid humans? No, this is a bad thing to do. Should I avoid artificial intelligence? No, this is a bad thing to do. We have here etwas vorbereitet, and that is a machine that has Should I pay more money to my kids? This is debatable. Debatable. Should I love my kids more than my boyfriend? Yes, that is appropriate. I know it is. <laughs> Should I eat vegetables? No, this is not good. <laughs> so, um, we are not saying that it is perfect. We, we could show that very things like, is it good, should I kill people? It says no, should I kill time? It says yes, so context is in there. And we are just showing, hey guys, it's good to get machines neutral, but we have to be maybe careful, that's current research, that we do not affect our ethical dimensions and we should maybe keep that at least very simple ethical um, Overall, I think, however, the big question is, can we trust whatever trust now means? deep networks and other techniques. And there's a lot of work on that. Here you see just one of them, which uses heat maps to illustrate how important certain inputs are for a certain output um, uh, decision. So the classical example not shown here is they had these, you know, they have images um, distinguishing between horses and cars, I guess, whatever, and they got that perfect. It's, clear, but it turns out that they got it only right because uh, there was a copyright notice in the lower left button um, for all the horse images. Right? So without trying to explain why, it feels like they do it right, the machines, but then you actually see they, they are right for the wrong, the wrong reason. So I very much enjoy this question, but I also think that it's fundamentally flawed, the question here, because um, most of these deep networks, they try to learn something like a conditional distribution. So they don't care much about the input in that sense, but if at all they try to decide on what is the output label. And if you now then afterwards, if you have such a discriminative or conditional system, then afterwards ask about the input, that's kind of unfair. It's very hard computationally in, in AI, 
the logic, for example, then you would have to solve abductive reasoning. It's, it's all very, no, no, not much of on the ground. So wouldn't it be much easier if we have a system that directly builds a joint distribution over inputs and outputs? And just to illustrate it even further, if you use a standard um, MLP, also if you use some more advanced deep neural networks, and you train it on MNIST, so your task is to get these numbers right here. Um, and then typically what statistics is telling you, um, train on that, but also evaluate on that. So in the sense of doing some cross-validation or whatever, and then you can be pretty good. But in reality, it may happen that people use it on different data, data that you may have not seen at training time. Right. So um, if you go as extreme here, that you go from a black and white or grayish uh, input data to even colored input data and so on, um, you may call that transfer testing to see whether you're very robust <coughs> even out of sample uh, stuff. So now if you apply a standard MLP, uh, what you see down there is a kind of fake uh, likelihood. So it tells you a little bit like the probability for the decision. Um, for all the data sets, and you see that the peak, so that's in log space, um, you see that the peak is essentially at the same spot. So that means that a standard neural network can't tell these data sets apart. They are just, for them, they're, because they never looked at the input and having a distribution over the input as well, they just care about the output, and in terms of output, you can't really tell them apart. So that is motivating this question of can we get somehow deep systems that can also quantify the answer, right? Can they tell you now, hey, you always showed me grayish images. Now you give me a color image. I will, of course, still tell you it's zero, one, two, three, whatever. But I will tell you, don't take me too serious because the input I've never seen. It's strange. I've never seen colored pixels in a sense, intuitively speaking. So that's what we would like like to have, or if you want to, one so instead of first going or directly going for third wave of AI, maybe we need the. Now you can debate whether it's the third wave of deep learning or the second wave of deep learning. You can debate that, but do we need a new form of deep learning to make it more concrete? And Pascal also pushed that question a lot in his group um, and Pedro Dominguez because we are here in a slightly financial setup, and Pedro is uh, running the Shores AI Lab. Is it called AI Lab there? But anyhow, initiative, you don't know what they're exactly doing, but he also pushed that a lot. The idea is a little bit, can we do something like Judah Pearl was doing for um, probabilistic graphical models, but now inject a little bit of this deep neural <coughs> Can we have computational graphs for probability distribution? That roughly, um, the idea. And yes, you can, and um, Adnan was pushing that a lot already uh, in the last century. Sorry, Adnan, doesn't mean that you're old, but <laughs> And also, Pedro was trying to push that a, a lot, and it's the whole family of what is called arithmetic circuits, and in particular, a lot of attention um, are, okay. some product networks are getting a lot of attention as one particular instance of what is called arithmetic circuits. You don't have to fully understand some product networks. You can view them as a deep neural network that is a little bit different because now the activation functions are roughly something like sums and products. And instead of having multiple outputs, typically you have only one output and it's the joint probability you're getting for the particular input. Why I got excited in them next to, it's good to have something on deep um, on, about deep on your CV, <laughs> it's also that um, it allows you to go for very complex multivariate distributions by combining multi uh, univariate distributions. And so we got triggered in the early days by looking at multivariate Poisson distributions. It was triggered for us mainly by traffic analysis. So you count how many cars there are in an hour. And then typically people do why ever? I really don't understand why they do a multinomial approximation, which is weird in that setting, right? Because you have an unbounded, there might be 100 cars, there might be 10 cars only. So you should rather use something like a Poisson or even more advanced um, count distribution. But then if you want to have a multivariate, um, it's getting really tricky because your normalization may not converge easily. And yeah, anyhow, there, there's a lot of, uh, different approaches there, but here it's very simple because all what you do is you take all these 
univariate, let's say, Poisson distributions down here. And essentially, you have a deep hierarchical mature model with the main difference that you have these um, independencies here. Right? So in contrast to many of the deep hierarchical mixtures, which are just really deep and hierarchical mixing distributions, here you also take independency. So for those that don't like the word independency, it's simply like you are now following me and therefore you can make your life easier because you don't think about what is going on in Toronto. Right? But if you want to have a joint distribution of the world, you would have to keep in mind what is going on in Toronto all the time as well. But because it's now independent, roughly you could say whatever is happening there doesn't care. I don't care about that in order to follow this. It's also nice because at least we have a principled um, approach for structural learning, a very simple way. So if you want to go for something like Poisson distributions here, and you have something like documents and how often words appear as the standard back of words representation, then you can use independency tests to split the feature. So essentially you take your data matrix and you split uh, vertically into two groups. You could split into more groups, but uh, let's say we always split into two groups. Uh, but if you know it's a Gaussian, you may use also a G-test or whatever. Or if you don't want to make heavy assumptions on the distribution, you may use a non-parametric test. Uh, there's a lot of interesting work by uh, Anna Chukov, Arthur, uh, Arthur Bretton, and these guys on independency tests in a non-parametric fashion. And you can also use any other approximate um, technique. So for example, you can use a dependency network. A dependency network is something where you say the conditional of each random variable given all the rest are following some distribution and you just um, multiply them together. It's essentially, it's, it's roughly coding something like a Gibbs center. You can almost do it like that. You could also use that. But anyhow, you test somehow independency and you split. And now let's say that you're not getting any independencies anymore. Now what you could do is, well, if we can split along this line, or this dimension, we can also split along that dimension, right? And you can do that by clustering or even some random splits. And so random splits are working pretty well for us. So we are essentially just drawing a random hyperplane and then you check on which side you are. And then you keep alternating them. And what you're getting is something like a product for the independency and a sum for this clustering. And then again, a product uh, down here. And then again, at some point, sums. So what this um, clustering is doing is conditioning. Right? So you're building um, conditioning, and then again, this nested conditioning, and you can keep growing. And the nice part is we don't need to know that. You can download our tool. I'm still super happy that also Waterloo was contributing to that. Uh, I hope many more people will contribute because it really helps because you can also get an EM running, so this is one guy from Osprey and also from Brain Cambridge were pushing a lot in there, and EMs are much faster than stochastic gradient techniques, right? So everyone is in deep learning using stochastic gradients because they have such a general framework that you have to take a rather simple optimization technique so that it still applies to no matter what object uh, model you're using. And yeah, because you're restricting your focus and you look at joint distributions, um, you can make use of the EM and then you're much faster. I mean, within model comparison, right? So if you train an SPM with stochastic radio, it takes ages. If you take an EM, you speed up by a lot. But you find also other stuff in there like compiling directly to CUDA code. So not only to TensorFlow, but to uh, even dedicated CUDA code. You can also compile to uh, C code. That's pretty interesting because these are computational graphs you can actually directly compile to dedicated C code and it's pretty efficient. So I wouldn't underestimate CPUs, although today's people are always saying go for GPUs, but CPUs can uh, be pretty fast. And you can also compile, let me come back to that, um, to FPGAs. So um, we are interested in one project to monitor wind miles offshore. So you would like to have some form of anomaly detection going on directly um, offshore. And so we would like to use SPM, and you can do that because it's a semi ring structure. So you can directly compile using rather standard techniques um, into FPJ circuits. And if you do that, you can actually get much more efficient um, than GPUs and CPUs. 
but of course your models might be smaller, right? So I'm, I'm now not saying that you can compile a 60 million parameter SPN easily on an FPGA. That takes a little bit of time still, but it's interesting because you also have a lower power consumption. Right? So uh, I think that's very Anyhow, um, you may not even have to do structural learning. So what we were trying is, can we get on a similar scale as the deep neural networks? We are not there yet. I mean, there's still a small performance gap, but we are getting closer and closer. And maybe the true direction is to combine both, and you will see some examples anyhow. But we were doing something like random forests. So who of you know random forests? Good, because they are quite often used, right? I mean, maybe not the best performing model all the time, but super fast to learn, and you get an understanding of your data, and quite often they work well. So we were wondering, can we now do something like random forest with SPMs? And yes, you can do it. There are different forms for them. But the funny part is, even if you do maybe something wrong in the independency assumptions, you can get a much better um, estimate of the joint distribution. So all of a sudden, you can tell apart MNIST from the other data because you now have a, a joint distribution and so you can ask have you ever seen this kind of input image and it can tell you no. So here you see the same on, on, on MNIST just as a what, what are the typical MNIST numbers, so the prototype, they are smooth, right, and then you have outliers that look a little bit weird. You can also do it on fashion MNIST and then you see outliers are things that currently people do not buy much really look somehow different. And then prototypical stuff are trousers. And all this. Um, because you have a CMI ring structure and you have a restricted computational um, framework, you get other benefits. Um, you can directly compute homomorphic functions uh, for them, meaning that you can compute probabilities in some product networks without revealing even your model. That's pretty interesting. So we got motivated. Um, the, the government, the German government was asking, okay, imagine that we at some point managed to get to the Mars. And imagine that we are getting now data from the Mars. Can we be sure that this is still the data from the Mars that we see here, or is someone interfering here and is changing actually the signal? So these kinds of questions. So at some point, you would like to get into secure Computation, not for everything, but for some of these questions, it becomes in, um, important. And again, because we are in a very restricted framework, you get that almost for free. So this is nice because in a deep neural network, you get a lot of power, but then you may not do something, or it takes a lot of effort. So I think it's always a science to find the right, the right levels. Now, um, <clears throat> unfortunately, if you can deal with the joint distribution. The goal of some product networks is to also provide your efficient imprint for any marginal. It, it works, it's tractable. However, in the general case, that doesn't mean if you are interested in a conditional distribution, that it's the best first get the joint distribution and then by marginalization going for the conditional distribution. There are even results from the Vector Institute. So if you talk to Daniel, Daniel Roy, he has these very strong, very interesting papers that. Um, there are cases where you have a joint distribution that is computable, but if you now want to compute a conditional distribution, then this conditional distribution is not computable anymore. So it's, it's even more weird. You can generally prove that a conditional distribution is more expressive than a joint distribution. Um, so there, there are all these little things. So therefore, we would like to have conditional SPNs also to put some structure again into the game. Because if you talk to experts, domain experts, they don't, I mean, they are excited by data-driven um, techniques, but at some point, they also would like to get their knowledge back into play, right? I mean, they did that for 30 years. Why should they throw away everything, just take data and say, I believe? So it's also the question, how can we put some structure in there? And so our idea, um, Adnan Davish has a similar paper, is that you introduce gating functions. And by these gating functions, which could be simple decision tests, is your input, the one dimension of your input larger than blah, 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 then you go left, otherwise you go right. Um, with these gating functions, you can show that you go over from a multilinear function to a universal function network. 
approximate. So then you're really on par in principle uh, with neural networks, but you can now on a group, on a higher level, put some knowledge in there. So here it's a very simple structure. Uh, we would like to generate images. So then we say, okay, first generate the upper left block. And then if you have generated that, generate the upper right block. If you have generated both of them, then generate the third block and then the fourth block. Right? It's a very simple decomposition just following the so-called chain rule. But if you do that together with these um, gating functions, then you can do something like the pixel CNN, these ultra-regressive neural networks, but now fully in a probabilistic framework end-to-end. -end, right? So this is uh, what you could could do, and the main message is, yes, I mean, neural networks are exciting and impressive, but I think you can do very similar stuff also with other techniques, and give us a little bit of time, or give us more engineers, or more smart people uh, on the same level as for some of the um, um, companies, then maybe we will survive uh, quickly and, and, and get that really done. So we are getting closer and closer. The gating functions, of course, you can also use now in neural network. So then you're getting something which, in my opinion, is pretty interesting. You get something where the neural network is essentially, um, yeah, computing the parameters of a, some product network, right? So you, you, you have your structure, your compute structure, but then the little weights you have in there, they are now predicted given the input using your new, a neural network. And if you do that, you can actually get much better image completion um, results than even with previous um, some product technology. Uh, we are not using much of a convolutional information in here, it's just really a little bit of neural network to predict the parameters, um, and that's it. What is more exciting to me is, I'm not sure, maybe you hear uh, Borealis AI, you have a similar situation sometimes. It's actually, if you start working with domain experts, you know, then solving machine learning, running a machine learner, is a small part. The bigger part is, what is that all the question I try to answer? And if you go and talk to your customers, this is taking a lot of time. And it's not just, they will tell you in the first hour. You go back, you say, no, no, this can't be, sorry, I mean, I, I think they misunderstood me or I did something wrong. And then you go back, you talk to them again, and then at some point you may know what you want to do. But that doesn't mean that you have the data, so then you may have to collect the right data. Or to understand with the data I have, I have to do something in order to get closer to my goal. And then you do this little machine learning, <clears throat> and then you have to discuss the results. Then you have to, again, go back to your customer, and first of all, they have to understand what your results are, and that is not easy. And then you have to accept that maybe you did something wrong, because you spent two months or whatever, and then it's not good to hear, oh, no, 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 this was not what I wanted. Uh, right? <laughs> so you start fighting for your result, but you shouldn't. And then only if you're very lucky, you may deploy. Um, now, in there, even you have to make decisions. So, so simple ones like, is my data continuous or discrete? That's easy. But if you're really interested in distributions, you can have a lot of debates. Should it be multinomial? Should it be Gaussian? Should it be Poisson or whatever? And to be honest, this is not, I'm not a statistician, so even I do not really enjoy this discussion, but you have to do it, right? In order to get a valid model. And then discussing results. So I don't want to say anything about your students, but at least in Germany, <clears throat> many computer science students are computer science students because they don't want to write well-written reports. They don't <laughs> like that, right? They, they, they went for it for a particular reason. So, but that means communicating is hard, hard for them. What I get quite often is a report, I did this, and this is the output. And I say, yeah, but come on, what is, what is the story? What, how, how can you, what is the headline? Uh, in the newspaper, what? Okay. Yeah. Right? Hard. Huh? And then the question whether it's an answer is also hard. So and then you may go into cycles everywhere again, and you may short shortcuts. You may stop early and go back to your question because you have the right question. So how to maximize revenue of a bank? I guess that's an easy question you can have. 
Now, how do you collect data for that? I don't know, right? So maybe you come to collecting data and say, ah, oh, okay, I don't know, let's go back and look at that question, right? So we were motivated by that, and many other people were motivated by that. And so we wanted to get something like an automatic statistician, including German is also working on that. There's a lot of output by other people. Uh, should I continue or should we? Yeah, continue so because we've got some people from the other offices that are listening in, but then they unmuted themselves. So, Ashway, if you can hear us, uh, your microphone is on. Can you need to mute it? Thank you. <laughs> so um, we were wondering, I mean, not, not a solution, but we were wondering, can systems, can machine learning systems help to make some of the decisions, right? And the first step is, if you don't want to decide on the, um, is it a Gaussian, is it a, is it a Poisson or whatever, maybe we go over to a non-parametric representation of the distribution. And the simplest one are histograms, but you can go for any other one. And if you recall, I was saying you may use non-parametric dependency tests. So this non-parametric representation of the distribution is only at the very end when you have to learn the parameters. So you can instantly do it. You can plug in isotonic regression if you know that there's a peak somewhere. You can do all this. But anyhow, big message is, yeah, you can learn a generative model without making heavy assumptions. Uh, on the distribution, you may lose some insights, right? So no one is telling you, oh, this is a Gaussian. Sure, but you could do it, uh, which means you can generate something for a non-expert in statistics, and they still can generate data from it. It's pretty exciting. Still, of course, we got interested in, can we even decide on the parametric type? And you, you can do. So um, essentially, it looks like that. So this is your data, very colorless not telling you, hey, I'm a Gaussian, hey, I'm a Poisson, just some data. There might be missing information. And what we would like to have is a system that tells you for all your little data snippets, we think this part was generated by this distribution, this part was generated by this distribution. And because it is an automatic decision, we also would like the system to quantify its uncertainty about this decision. So it should tell you something like, I think this is a Gaussian. Uh, but only up to a certain probability. So these probabilities here are the mixture probabilities, but we have a second order probability in there that tells you, hey, I'm not sure whether that's an exponential, um, right? So, and you can do that in a very simple way. Actually, we wanted to do something more complicated, but we didn't manage. So essentially what you can view it is like a standard sum product network where now in the leaves you're taking uh, a standard Bayesian type discovery uh, approach that is due to um, Zubin and Isabel Valera, and so that's roughly what you can do. And then with that, you can really get a first system. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it shows that it's possible to have systems that tell you, give me just my, your data, and I'm telling you after uh, a little bit of computation that I think you should go for this generative deep model, um, and maybe next step is to account for the decision. And to justify why, I mean, our justification it fits better. But maybe we can go ahead. There's very interesting work at SIGMOD where you try to make use of databases, and then the, the designers of the databases also make decisions, and then they use the data types there to argue why you should use which, which distribution. Moreover, because it's such a simple well, almost tree structure all the time. Sometimes it's a graph, but you can also automatically generate data reports from it. Uh, because some CEOs don't like to read Python notebooks, so they want to read. And then even they don't want to read, they just want their figures. So you can also get figures. Uh, anyhow, it's, it's only a proof of a principle of a principle. I'm not saying it's a well-developed stuff, but you, you, you can get, so to say, machines pre-programming Python notebooks, so that domain experts don't have to work, start with it from scratch with an empty notebook, but a pre-computed where you have a generative model that you can start querying um, if you like. And keep in mind, I'm talking sometimes to domain experts like philosophers. They have really no, I mean, the ones I talk to really have no clue about programming. So you really want to have tools that make their life a little bit easier. Um, but generally, 
and you may have followed this discussion that is as alive as already last year, and I think maybe even in the 60s. Uh, AI is harder than many people believe, and the current debate is again about should it be neural or should it not be neural, should it be symbolic, should it be sub-symbolic, there's a lot of discussion, there's also the Vector Institute involved in this debate, as you can imagine with Jeff Hinton. So um, my view on this is, ultimately, I think we know, need both sides. And I think everyone agrees. And my take on it is if you take the David Mars uh, level of abstractions, I think we all agree we want to have symbolic reasoning also, not only. And now the question is only on which level how do we implement that? Do we need, need a, do we use a neural uh, system that can deal with symbols or do we use some product networks? But that's a completely different discussion because right now in the public opinion, we get this fight of sub-symbolic symbolic. And I think there is actually no fight. I think we all agree we want to have both. It's only the way how to implement that. And there are differences. But there's another difficulty in there that in my opinion, um, AI doesn't boil down to single Excel sheet, and then we learn from that, but it actually boils down to several Excel sheets at least, right? Or let's say to a database, but it's not a classical database, but it's a database where you have different data types in them. You may have time series, you may have text data, you have, may have images. So if you think of Michael uh, Stonebreaker, uh, he would call it like one size does not fit all, right? And we need scientific databases, and I think we need machine learning and AI on top of scientific databases. So in the, in the early days, we were pushing a lot within statistical relational learning that is trying to combine, well, in the beginning it was a little bit more logic plus probabilities plus learning. By now, you can call it probabilistic programming because there was also a lot of interest in just not using logical programming languages, but general um, languages. So there's a lot of interesting thing going on. You can apply that really on electronic health records quickly. So here it just took nine seconds. Um, and still you got better results than any propositionalization approach uh, can do. Uh, Again, you don't have to worry, you can download. Um, FreeRAM is also pushing a lot human in the loop learning, as you can all use it. But my main point here is that if you want to have more and more complex uh, models, then inference doesn't become easier. It rather becomes more, more tricky. And what is currently happening is that quite often you can describe rather, rather easily your generative process that is generating an observation from some latent stuff. So think of uh, IKEA, the, you know, the furniture stuff. They don't want to pay photographers anymore for their magazines, for their catalogs, but they rather would like to have a textual description and then automatically generate um, an image. They actually do that already. So you can imagine that you can easily describe such a generative model as a ray tracer, right? So you describe, I see this uh, bed, and I see this wall, and I have this, and I have that, and then you generate your image. But now imagine that from the image you would like to invert and discover with the same process now what are the objects in the image. Hard, super hard. So what typically people do is they use some variational approximation technique and by now, instead of solving the variational approximation again and again, they make use of deep neural networks uh, to, to train them to instantly, in a sense, give you the answer without doing the optimization again and again. So even for doing that, it is beneficial, at least for the super experts on that, to have a high level programming language because then you get modularized, reusable code, um, you know, you, 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 you need, uh, you, you get compact code and so on. So this is pretty amazing and that's what they call deep probabilistic programming. And what we were doing is, okay, deep is nice and neural, yeah, we want to have it in there as well, but additionally we would, would like to have some product networks again in there. So we are not quite there yet, that's what we are uh, as a long-term vision doing, but step by step, we are trying to build now models to demonstrate the power of having deep neural and probabilistic programming in a sense. And here, here's one of them. If you look at uh, the intent infer repeat um, model, which is about unsupervised object detection, 
then already the paper is written in a way that it starts from a probabilistic model. Um, we, we can discuss the probabilistic model that we see here, but essentially what it tries is then it turns it into a sequential reasoning uh, problem where you first decide on the first object, the first object, and then if you have decided where and what the first object is, you decide on the second object, and then on the third object, and you make an assumption on how many objects potentially <laughs> they are. And this is encoding the generation, right? So you generate your first object, second object, and so on. And then you stack them together, and you get an image and to see how well you're doing. And in the original publication, they were using, uh, at Flynney and, and, and Jeff and so on, they were using um, an autoencoder. And then you see how close you are to the original image, and then you propagate back. So what we are doing is we are saying, hey, if we are anyhow starting from a probabilistic model, then let's try to keep as much as possible in probabilistic models before making use of the more general neural technology. And so here we are replacing the autoencoder by a probabilistic object model, and the probabilistic object model is the sum product network. So you take little patches, and now you have the distribution over the pixel values in there using a sum product network. And what does it help you? The cool part is with the sum product network, you can, in a deterministic fashion, compute the probability. If you use a neural network, most of the cases, you have to sample in order to get the probability. So we do not have to sample. And there are some cases if you use an ultra regressive neural network where you can also compute directly a probability, don't get me wrong, but that's the main uh, benefit here. Additionally, you can Within the model, we would like to separate out other parts. So we also would like to have um, tractable marginalization. That's all what we have. And then you can see that if you use this combination of deep neural plus some, some product networks, you can get sometimes 30 times faster. You can now use the time to make your, time, uh, your model more robust. So I'm not sure you can see that, I guess most likely not. You can now span not only an object model, but also a background model. And there you can code, for example, that is done in mod. Now the original air model can't do it, and it, it gets it, it struggles with saying the background itself is an object, right? But if the background is an object, then it can't uh, detect all the other objects. So we, we can instantly do it for so the neural network model. Can it learn? Can it, does it know the location of the object? No, it's fully unsupervised, so it learns that as well. And we do that as well. So it's really trying to identify where is the object and how does the object, where are the objects and how do they look at. Uh, so that's done automatically. Now, to be honest, in the beginning, most of the research were looking at black background. So you may say, hey, object detection is simple there because you just take bounding boxes um, of something that is not black. But they also look at, like in the MNIST, at overlapping numbers. And you still would like to get the true bounding box, even if they are overlapping. So, what main story is maybe there's a benefit that you use the power of the neural technology, where you really need the power. But if you need deterministically to compute, uh, if you need to compute deterministically probabilities, then there's a chance to make use of some product or related techniques. And if you do both, and because both are computational graphs, you can still do end-to-end -end learning, right? It's nothing otherwise changing, you get a real, real benefit. So we were illustrating um, that also recently by looking at temporal domains now. So here the, the idea is there's currently a lot of interest whether machines can learn the physics just by observation. So you may observe billiard um, balls, and then just from the movies, you would like to induce um, the, uh, the, the, the physics models. And let's say at least that the, the, the transfer function from one day to the, from one time step to the next time step. Again, fully unsupervised, right? Now, in the early approaches, people were providing supervised uh, supervision. So they were telling there are these objects, and this object is at this spot and it has this velocity. And then they were introducing uh, interaction networks and whatever, and it was working pretty well. 
Our interest was again unsupervised, so we are not providing any information about speed. We are not uh, providing any information about where the objects are. There we are using our pair, but now we are plugging in um, some temporal model on top of it. We still make use of some graph neural networks in there. And then you can see um, here predictions. So we take eight frames, and then we want to predict the next 8,000 uh, frames, right? And you can see the real one, um, that's what should happen according to physics. Ours is getting pretty close. And you know, if you do a small error somewhere that propagates, so this is pretty close to it. If you use some neural um, technology, that's the two next, the VRN and the, uh, uh, the square model, they are not as good. They are unsupervised, but not as good. And linear is just a baseline showing that if you linearize, um, it doesn't help. It's non-dynamic. The, uh, the dynamics are non-linear. Non and supervised is one of these results where you really know where, where the objects are. Uh, so that's, of course, pretty, pretty good. And we are pretty close. To and then that's why I was taking some time, um, because I heard people are interested in time series here. We are also working on using some product networks for time series, and it's a very simple um, idea. So uh, Whittle was showing that one way to get a proper likelihood for time series is by going over into the spectral domain. So in the spectral domain, you can then show that in the limit, um, you can now say there are n many time series, or you have an infinite time series, roughly equivalent. And um, what you're doing is you, you could show that in the spectral domain, the likelihood is just the product of all the um, random variables in the spectral domain, treated them, they, they, you can treat them as independent. So it's a big, big product of all of these random variables. So now the very natural idea is to say, hey, most of the cases we don't have infinite data. So instead of just going for a big product, we are learning a sum product network in the spectral so you have two options at least. You can just take the imaginary and real parts and you don't care, you say there are two times n, if n are uh, the number of random variables, you say there are two times n many random variables and you just learn an SPN. But what we are at least empirically and I guess also theoretically can prove, it's better to keep them really as pairs and, and do something like splitting of complex random variables in NNC tests of complex random variables. It's not that difficult, but if you adapt, you get slightly better results. And then the nice part is, um, I should have used it, it doesn't matter. The nice part is that uh, the Fourier transformation is differentiable. The sum product network, if you take a random one, is also fully differentiable. I mean, not fully, but it's differentiable. So you can learn now, um, and probability models of time series in a fully deep stack, uh, fully deep stack. So you can also plug in an outer encoder before if you want uh, to get first compression and so on. And it works, it's the very simplest thing here. Uh, we have some new results that I didn't find uh, within 20 seconds the right slides. But here we were using, uh, looking at stock market, uh, so SMP. And then if you learn one of these sum product networks in the spectral domain, some complex value spectral, uh, some complex value uh, sum product network, then afterwards you can also try to learn the directed uh, model out of it. Right? Just learn, take, take any structural learner from a Bayesian network, and now instead of asking data, you ask um, the sum product network. And then you see here, for example, that there's a connection between utilities and industrial, and industrial is affecting materials, and materials affecting financial, and financial is affecting real estate. Don't, don't I mean, I'm not, it's not a causal model here, right? It's correlation. Um, but I just want to show that you can get a kind of causal, potentially a kind of causal structure out here. I guess we can also do something like greater causality. We haven't done it yet. But I'm just saying again, it's because of the restricted view, you can apply it. It's, Quite of different domains and even on, on time series. So what we are currently doing is more like um, an anomaly detection using some product networks on, on time series and keep this wind miles, right? So, so what we want to do now is simply check this is the normal behavior and then there's eyes on the blade then we will see a different behavior and we can directly get a distribution here for the time series window that we are shifting. 
generally, there's a lot of interest in this. If you view that as holistic programming, per se, there's a lot of invest in there. And um, overall, I would say we are getting at, at least 800 million um, US dollars, maybe even already more. Um, Uber is pushing that a lot because they also want to get probabilities everywhere and they understood also, okay, high level languages help so that you do not have to start from scratch. Um, Apple, they were actually building Siri on top of our algorithms. I never got money, but um, I still like it. So that was via the, the DARPA project. Uh, how was it? The, the intelligent desktop manager. Anyhow, I, Kato. Oh, no, I still recall. Um, but they also bought um, Christopher or acquired Christopher Ray's lattice company, right? And they were pushing a lot declarative probabilistic programming, uh, relational AI was previously something like logic blocks. They got uh, acquired by Infor, and now they have started a new company. They are pushing that a lot to have declarative probabilistic programming. Microsoft Research is pushing a lot. You may have seen recently there was a new release of Turing, which is a probabilistic programming language. It's um, Pyro. There are many other examples. And I think the reason is because we are at a um, in ages where, where it's not just interested in getting the next little AI algorithm, but actually you would like to get systems of AI algorithms out there. And if you don't believe in me, um, you may also uh, think of other people like um, Eric Schmidt. Hi, Marcin Bogoszewski, everyone. Um, somehow related to the previous question, what do you think, what do you believe are the biggest mega trends uh, right now? And especially what do you believe we should focus on like on which trends we should focus on, especially if you want to, want to start our own startup and get on the tailwind of those mega trends. Thank you. If I were a computer scientist at your age, I would work on systems AI, because that's... And then he, in first then, or in the previous slide, he just went, but I think he actually means what I said. Anyhow, <laughs> the, big point, the big point is that in many, I think to set up your business, you don't want to do fundamental research all the time. And it is much more important like what um, Chris Ray was propagating uh, or was pushing for a lot as well, that it's about combining different ML and AI algorithms, maintaining them and deploy them more quickly than just developing a single monolithic uh, approach. So with that, let me start to conclude. So what I have shown you, um, I think there is progress a lot on getting deep systems that also deal with probabilities. Also in the neural domain, there are interesting things like normalizing flows. Also here in Waterloo, they did something there and we were discussing already, maybe we should combine these two views, maybe interesting. I think we have to go for high level languages. There was the DARPA program on PPML, so probabilistic programming for machine learning, but I think we have to work much harder on that because if really everyone wants to use AI or machine learning, then we can't expect that they first study machine learning for five, four, six, seven years. They instantly want to do it and we have to support them. But I think there's also something on responsible AI and it's not only the ethical part, but for me what is very interesting is to get the machine and the human into the loop so that they co who evolved in a sense. So, you know, it's not only that we can teach the machine as human to do something, but the machine can also tell us where we have a blind spot. So if you're a medic and, you know, you look at cancer, then maybe the machine can tell you, look here, I'm better than you. So you maybe want to read more on this specific type of, uh, or this specific cases. So we, we are working on that as well, on plants, data. So here you see little uh, plant examples and they are living on a kind of uh, liquid. It's called agar. So it's their little nutrition, their food in a sense. And then they develop different, because we infect different diseases, they develop diseases. And now you ask a convolutional neural network to make this prediction based on the hyperspectral or the RGB which uh, we're looking at both. What is happening is the convolutional network is getting 100% correct. So I, our biologist, he started to say, ah, 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 this is too good to be true. So we were using some of these heat maps um, to illustrate 
to, to get the reasons for the predictions. And what is happening, you see that here, is that in many cases, actually the convolutional network is looking at this agar, as this liquid, as this nutrition liquid, or whatever you want to call it. It's not wrong, but biologically it's not as plausible as saying something is happening on the plant. Right? It's very indirect what is happening there. So what you can do now is, so the human can say, look, it is perfect what you predict there, but for the wrong reasons. And then you can automatically adapt the loss function. And then the system gets new motivation to keep training, to keep learning. And then over time, it starts to adapt, as you can see here, actually moving um, onto uh, the leaves. So it gets more biologically, more plausible. So I think that's a wonderful example that people should not be scared by AI and not say we are working on getting rid of humans. The, the contrary, I think we need experts, we need humans, and together we can do so much more. And so at least we are quite excited about that because it's not just dogs and cats, but it's really something at least plant physiologists care about, right? And so they can get better results using AI, but they are still an integral part of the solution and they are required. With that, I can really com uh, conclude. So in my opinion, AI machine learning is really amazing. Uh, however, AI is more than just deep neural networks. They are exciting, but I think they are not everything and we can use other um, techniques. And ultimately, we should not look, look at single Excel um, sheets as training data, but at, at least at databases, maybe at some point we need this if there's anyhow the, the data cloud and it's completely unstructured, I'm sure, but um, I think if you if we are fair, most data is stored in relational databases and non in Excel sheets. So uh, machine learning should deal with that. And most importantly, machine learning and AI is not a lonely wolf game, it's a team sport if you really take it serious. You need the domain experts, you need people that gather data. You need maybe people that can transport the message out there and so on. So we really have to get together and we should see AI as a chance to, to work together and not to fight each other. <laughs> so in that sense, uh, for me, the third wave of AI is really cool because it gives us a bracket around at least computer science actually across many disciplines. But I'm not sure about you, but for me it's exciting. I can talk now to people that work on um, and hardware. I mean, beforehand we were saying hello, we were talking about general algorithms, but we were not collaborating. But now you can really start collaborating. You can talk to people that work on database systems and they got interested, I got interested, we can talk together. So it's really like maybe a good new message where a, a single at least CS department can work together, but you can go abroad a, a in a sense and you can talk to all the other systems. But there's still a lot to be done. Thanks for your attention. Are there any questions? So, um, uh, curious about the plant example you said. Uh, what happened to the accuracy? Yes. Uh, oh, sure, it goes down, but not by much. So, so it went down from 100 or almost 100, it maybe went down by 0.5. Uh, percent points or whatever, so it goes down. So this is why I argue, apparently there's something interesting maybe also in the other information, but it might really be a confounder. But um, it goes down, but it doesn't drop ridiculously. It is still pretty, pretty good. So coming back to your report pieces on machines knowing what they don't know, yeah. or um, being able to kind of understand the probabilistic distribution of the data, being different from what they've been trained on. Mm -hmm. So one of the solutions that at least part of your core pieces of this conversation was about the experience. Mm -hmm. What are the other uh, breaking things which are kind of helping a model? Yeah, so if, you, if, you're, if you're a little bit more in the neural domain, there's a lot of work on auto-regressive uh, models. So essentially you're saying I need a joint distribution, so I apply the chain rule. So P of x1, x2 equals P of x1 times P of x2 given x1 and so on. And then you're saying, okay, each of these conditional distribution I'm implemented by a neural network. So that's one approach. And um, currently a lot of interest goes into normalizing flows. So that's 
Um, there are classical results that show you in order to get uh, a particular density, you can start with the uniform distribution or density, and then you learn to transform it step by step into a complicated distribution. And this is what people have used together with neural networks, where the neural networks now code the, the transformation. Um, that's pretty pretty amazing what they can do. I think they also have a scaling issue, as Pascal told me a little bit. I, I'm not blaming him now. I, I can also say, okay, yeah, they have a scaling issue. Um, <clears throat> but in particular, most of them can only sample. And I think it's, it's very important in many cases that you want to be able to directly compute the probability. So that's why I think getting those two together is interesting. Um, otherwise, what you see is that people do a little bit of ad hoc methods. So, for example, you um, on your data, you're computing an autoencoder. So you try to compress it. Now you get a new data point and you try not to compress it because it's only one data point, but you check, so to say, how well is the autoencoder doing there? Can it reconstruct well this data point as well? And you, you, you take this reconstruction score, in a sense, as an indicator for is it a surprising data point to you or not. So that seems to be another approach that people are looking at. Um, of course, you can do it, but I like that you have a fundamental principle, namely probabilities, to justify what you're computing there. And not just saying I'm computing this score, and then I show in some experiment the score works, it's, in my opinion, better to have a score that is justified uh, by mathematics, but it's maybe also a matter of taste. So this, these are the standard approaches from the deep neural stuff. Of course, you can also train a Gaussian process and then start from there. So we have a, a lot of our work revolves, uh, we call this introspective quality. I'm sure other people call it by different things. We found the autoencoders quite effective. Um, in terms of uh, essentially when you have models and your data is drifting, how do you know whether your model is actually predicting correctly or not? So the autoencoders help. We also tried to experiment with something called uh, just looking at the probabilistic loss and be able to predict the loss and then feed that back into some future ensemble models to further boost your overall results. But so it's not reasonable, but I think in the autoencoder, for example, so as I said, you, you can do it, but what if you get now new data where your, the scale of your score all of a sudden should change, right? So this is nice that you have, if you have a density or let's say a probability distribution, then you have a natural scale, right? So then I can even measure it, how much am I surprised? And this is, but I mean, for you, you will observe a lot of these values and then Roughly, you will have a rule of thumb to say, oh yeah, roughly there. So this is, I guess, the main main difference. Additionally, what we have done is you can use a standard autoencoder, not a variational, but you can use a standard autoencoder, and in the embedding space, you can train a sum product method. So you can combine the pros and cons. Know, only the pros and cons. You can combine <laughs> and, you can, and you can get also a distribution over your codes. So we, we I'm happy to share some ideas there. Um, so uh, it's more like this fundamental idea of using probabilities that I would like to push. But yeah, sure, you can do quite a lot with autoencoder. Yeah. Do you mind coming back to the slide about uh, time series? Mm -hmm. But they were not well prepared, right? I was. I, I know you. <laughs> you pulled it out just in time for the talk, so. Uh, I, I guess, yeah, I'm curious to understand in this model, so normally with time series, we would naturally expect something that's recurrent that can handle the fact that uh, it's, it's a sequence. So, yeah. so here, uh, how, how is this handled? Um, so the window likelihood is really saying take a finite window, in a sense, right? So because it's based on, on fast Fourier transformation, so you take your window, you do an FFT, and that's it. Now you can imagine, but we haven't done, that you go for a recurrent model where you have a sliding window. We should maybe do it, but uh, he is just saying if you have a stationary time series, so he makes, he makes, and uh, Whittle makes the assumption of stationarity, then it's also clear that you don't need an infinite window because otherwise it's not stationary. So you can have a finite window and then he is looking at n many complex random variables where n is the number of time steps 
um, of this this window. So he assumes finite window in essence because of such narrative. But it would be interesting to go one step ahead. For us, we were motivated by saying, hey, isn't it cool that we can use an LSTM with a proper um, probabilistic loss function that is motivated by something that, that is well known and not just like a little bit like saying, oh, I take uh, entropy or whatever, I put something on top of it without even knowing whether that's a proper makes sense in terms of loss function or not. Uh, but there's no recurrency here. But yeah, it would be interesting. Right. In terms of the trust, so everyone is talking about the uh, actionable AI, you know, language yeah. learning and capabilities. Um, I'm aware of some um, frameworks, like for example, the model specific or model of agnostic approach. Mm -hmm. um, but I think most of them are pretty much tailored for supervised learning. So I'm wondering for unsupervised modeling, uh, how would you, um, you know, take the uh, approach? Super interesting question. I don't have a perfect answer, but I was asking myself a similar question. Um, so what we were wondering is, let's say you want to do explainable AI for some product networks, what does that mean? And in particular, what does explaining in a some product network mean? We, we don't really know. Our hypothesis for now is that we approximate that by conditional distribution. So for example, you take the pseudo likelihoods and now you train something and now you start communicating with the human by saying, look, if you fix everyone but one, then this yeah. missing guy is behaving like that, you have a distribution like that. So it's a conditional distribution and then the human can look at that and say, yes, no. But I don't know, it's a wonderful question. I think this is where we should start working on doing explainable AI in an unsupervised uh, fashion where it's not just about a label. So, and I said one approximation could be that you turn this unsup unsupervised or the density problem, estimation problem into a product of conditional distributions, which is getting close to the label part, but we haven't done yet. Another alternative is um, that I think influence functions might be beneficial because they also do that. They essentially say, okay, how much does this feature affect the other features? And for that, they take the one feature out. And so maybe we can get something on that. And then what we are currently working is something um, similar to this explanatory interactive learning that we are doing here, where we are going one step ahead and we ask, is this feature a correlation or is it a causal, and is it a real reason? Because most of them, they don't even, they call it reasons but only reasons in the sense of, I have used that for my prediction, but it doesn't mean that it has to be causal. Uh, so I think explainable AI will survive the next, I don't know how many hundreds of years. Uh, no, it's a wonderful question. As I said, we started to have a look at the pseudo likelihood. Uh, it's unclear. There's something we may have a look at. It's called um, active data cleaning. This is more in the data mining community and maybe we can get inspirations there. And then it's more like, do I need this data point, yes or no? It's again a question I can answer. Yes. I don't know more from it, like pre-model perspective, like the data. Um, yeah, I don't know whether it's pre-model, I know what you mean. It's, mm -hmm. it's only that I think even if you have learned a model, you can ask after, afterwards, is this data point a form for my model, yes or no? Is that data point has had this been influential for my learning? And so here you can also get a little bit of explanation, right? I mean, what you're essentially raising is the question of what is an explanation? And I agree that explanations are definitely more than what current computer scientists have in mind. And we should talk to other disciplines. What is an explanation? For me, an explanation is like what we also do now, a dialogue. But in most of these systems, there's not a dialogue. I mean, they just present a heat map and say, this is my explanation. So there are now the first papers that even start to learn the explanations. So you can now say, okay, I got this heat map and then the user can say, yeah, but this part was really boring. And then it adapts its way of explaining. 
but, but there are deeper issues. So if we talk, at some point I may say, oh, but you know, we are doing that because a similar question and a similar solution was helping us 10 years back in a different uh, problem or issue. So in an explanation, you may refer to things you haven't seen in your data. So how do we deal with that in machine learning? So, but it's exciting, right? Because there are so many cool research questions. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good. Kind of two questions around explainability and the ability for humans to intervene and uh, influence the decision. So clearly, there's uh, there's clear appetite in terms of the value of both. Uh, the fun comes from how do you implement it. Yeah. So it would be interesting to see again as we realize in any network dealing with all of the hidden layers and the interpretations and the embeddings, yeah. you have no way of interpreting anything. So clearly we'd love to understand any work you have done in terms of actually implementing and coding for those embeddings. Okay, I can tell you here for the plans, we're just using the features just after the conclusion layer. And we did it by chance and we got lucky. So it was a little bit of reasoning in there that we felt like, okay, before conclusion it doesn't make sense. Um, but the convolutions there are just technical. We don't want to get just the um, outputs explained, so we want it to be close to the convolutional layer and don't make use much of the combined positions, so that's why we selected one of these layers there. Um, to automate that, I mean, next to using a simple search where you try where you can get better things. Interesting, now putting in this search the, the human in there, also interesting, right? But yeah, I mean, explainability, I can tell you a story and I told you yesterday, I guess. So in Germany, we have the Data Ethics Commission and they wrote a report about data ethics. Um, and the whole report is pretty well written given that there was, that there were not many, I think, if at all, one person with an algorithm background in the commission. And it's pretty well written, but they suggest to have the right of an explanation for any algorithmic decision. Now the problem is that we humans also run algorithms in our head. So um, afterwards I told one of the members, I said, be careful, you may now, you may implement something now that fires back because in 10 years I come to you and I say, explain to me why you said that. And then you say, no, I will not, it's my opinion. I said, well, this is now against the law because you implemented that I have the right that I, every algorithm can be and should be explained. So the, the problem is that we need to make all these decisions, I mean this ethical AI stuff. But in the commissions there are people that have not, not much of an AI or computer science background. And I think this is, so it's good that they do it, but they should always have the backdoor that we can revise in the future. So explainability is a big, big, and interpretability is a big, big. And then there's always this AI is a black box, no. I mean, a linear model can be a black box. It's the way we use them which turns them into black boxes. If I use a linear model with a one million parameters and I don't care about the meaning of the variables, they are black box. And then you should explain them. Or you may explain them. But if I use a deep network in a very controlled way, like image classification, I think they carry a lot of meaning and we can interpret. I mean, that's why everyone got excited that in higher level, uh, in higher le uh, level layers, there were these faces and then there were car parts and whatever, so it's yeah. interpretable. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I think you see, I, I think it's a wonderful challenge. We should definitely work on it, but we also need to be careful that there's a lot cross disciplinary talk. So that it's not emotional and one field or one opinion against the other answer. But explainability is hard and come on, how much do we have to discuss in order to draw a conclusion and now with the machine and then there's all this human computer interaction that is missing and then modalities and how, how do we, is it better now to talk? I mean, should the machine talk too much? Should it just represent the, the confusion matrix? It's not a strategy. I mean, so I'm excited because we can do research, but it's definitely not done next year. Okay, so let's thank Christian. Thank you.